Our text for our sermon this evening is recorded in Romans chapter 11, where the Apostle Paul writes, O the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out! Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. This is God's word. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, dearly loved by God. What are they thinking? Isn't it difficult enough sometimes to understand what's going on in our heads, let alone what's going on in someone else's? I'm reminded of the members of our Bible class on Sunday morning when I throw out there one of my questions. And I can tell by that deer-in-the-headlight look on their face, they're wondering, What question or what answer is pastor looking for? What is he thinking here? Well, this evening we'll take that what's going on in other people's heads and apply it in the relationship that we have with our God. Very often, what's going on in God's mind is a mystery to us. Very often, you and I do not really understand and are left in the dark about God's thoughts. But this evening, not to be frustrated by that, not to think somehow that that's unfair, we're going to follow the Apostle Paul and instead do this. We're going to offer a tribute to God's wondrous ways. And by doing that, that first of all gives us an incentive to praise God, and it gives us a preventative from blaming God. When the Apostle Paul wrote these words, he was in no way suggesting that he was frustrated or felt bad or left out, that God did not reveal everything to him. In fact, it's just the opposite. He offers a tribute to God's wondrous ways that are unsearchable and are past finding out. He writes, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. This marvelous truth is our incentive for praising God rather than questioning his ways with us. I don't know, and you don't know, what's on God's mind. We are in the dark about what the Lord is thinking, except in those areas where he has given us specific revelations of his person, of his will, of his actions toward us lost sinners. And there we know. But there are many other things that we don't know. That God has not revealed to us everything that is on his mind, that God has not let us see everything that he is thinking, does not cause us to reject him or to curse him. Rather, it is our incentive to praise him. Now, when the Apostle Paul writes here, He is not thinking so much about God's mind and thinking 
when it comes to creation and preservation of our daily lives. But God does that. And let me look at those things for just a second to illustrate what we're talking about a little bit. Think of the countless stars in the sky, and you look through the viewfinder of your digital camera, and you snap a picture. And then you look at it, and you see countless stars just in that little picture. You don't see the whole picture, but you see just a little bit of what is there. And in Psalm 120 or 147, the psalm writer says, God determines the number of stars and calls them by name. So looking at just that little bit, I know that God made those stars because he's revealed that. I know that even though there's countless stars in the sky, he made them all and he has given them names. So even though I see just that little bit, I know that God is also taking care of all the rest. Very often, God lets us see only a little bit, but we know that he's taking care of all the rest. We only get just a little snapshot of what God is has revealed to, or in what God has revealed to us. We get just a little taste of his actions in our lives by things that happen from day to day. What we see always is God's patience and God's love. What we see are the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. That he who made the countless stars in the sky and gave every one of them a name knows me and died for me. And died for the billions of people that will live on this earth between the Garden of Eden and the second coming of our Lord Jesus. The Apostle Paul gives a tribute to God's wondrous ways because we know that they are there for us and that is our incentive for praising him. Just before the words of our text in the chapters just before this, God had reviewed for the Gentiles in Rome and the Jews a history of God's forgiveness and mercy in Christ. First in the call to Abraham, and then to God's people, and then later also to the Gentiles. Paul summed it up by saying, God has had mercy on us all. That's what God has revealed. But as Paul developed that, he went back and he was asking himself some questions, some of them out loud to the Romans. Why did God choose Abraham? Why did God favor Jacob over Esau? Why did God wait as long as he did to send the Savior that he had first promised in the Garden of Eden? How come God is so loving to his people and at other times so severe? Paul didn't know the answers to all of those questions. But Paul also knew that what he doesn't know about God is wrapped up in what he did know about God. What you and I don't understand and know about God as he interacts with us in our daily lives is wrapped in what we do know. That all things work together for our good. The God who didn't spare his son Jesus will also freely with him give us all things. That no harm will come to us as God sends his angels to watch over us and protect us. Do we always know what God is thinking? Do we always know the the exact answer that God is looking for by something that comes into my life? 
No. But in the big picture, we know that God made us and that God loves us and that he sent Jesus to be our Savior from sin. There are some other unknowns in our lives that really are for us this evening and every day to serve as incentives to praise God. What about that terrible accident that you don't know didn't happen to you because God was protecting you? What about that disease that you or your loved one didn't get because God was watching over you and protecting you. You and I go through life ignorant, blessedly, of how God and the angels lead us not into temptation by getting in the way of all those things that want to harm us, by delivering us from evil each and every day of our lives, by preventing those things coming into our lives. Those are the unknowns that are our incentive to praise God. What is really amazing and wonderful and we think primarily about this evening and whenever we get together though, is we know the cross and we know our baptismal font, the baptismal font, and we know the Lord's Supper. And we know that tonight when we ask God for forgiveness, he has revealed his will to us that he does forgive us each and every time that we come to him. How wonderful on this Thanksgiving that God still loves me after what I did since last Thanksgiving. How wonderful that God called me by his grace to be a member of his family. How wonderful that in the midst of the billions of people alive today, that God knows me and the little snapshot of his knowledge. He sees me and he knows me and he knows my name and he provides my daily bread and all my spiritual blessings. Paul gives quite a wonderful tribute to God's wondrous ways. And that also serves as a preventative from blaming God. Who gets blamed for sin and evil more than God? I don't think really anybody when you think about it. Haven't you ever heard somebody say, I can't love a God that would cause millions of people to starve. I can't believe in God, in a God that would let children go hungry or would be born into abusive families. I can't worship and think that there would be a God who would allow war, who would allow natural disaster, who would allow poverty. I just can't believe in a God who I don't understand doesn't always treat me better than he treats everybody else. And that's what they really mean. What they really mean is, I won't believe in God because he doesn't always explain himself to me. I won't believe in a God who doesn't tell me everything that's on his mind and it had better agree with what's on my mind. I just can't accept a God who doesn't let me go through life answering me, doing everything for me that I want him to do. They make it sound like God is the author of sin. They make it sound like God is the cause of injustice and evil in life. No, it's not God. It's them. And it's not them, just, it's us. It's we, according to our sinful nature. How often do we sin by having those very same thoughts? By getting angry at God, by getting frustrated with God, 
by thinking God has deserted us, by questioning God, because things aren't going just the way that I want, and God hasn't explained to me just quite exactly why that is. When we do that, what are we thinking? We certainly aren't thinking about Paul's tribute to God's wondrous ways. Because when we're thinking about those, that is a preventative for me blaming God for the sin and evil and injustice and all the difficulties that there are in a sinful world and that we and other sinners cause. The temptation to doubt God, the temptation to question God is always near. But when it creeps up, or maybe rushes up, then it's time for us to remember what Job said when God called him to task for questioning God about what was going on in his life. Job's example is a good one, as Job came to realize just exactly what he had been doing. Job wrote, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. Job put his hand over his mouth, and he realized, this has got to stop. I can't question and doubt God. Does God understand my questioning? Does God understand my frustration? Absolutely. But we have to realize that we need to prevent that from coming into our lives and getting the best of us in life. And when we realize our error, when we realize what we've done, we turn to our God and know that he has forgiven us in Jesus. Paul asks, who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been the Lord's counselor? Certainly not us. We don't know God's mind. We cannot be his counselor and tell him what to do. He loves us, though, and sent his son to redeem us from those sins and from death and from the power of the devil. No one has ever done anything for God that God should repay us. God has been merciful to us. God has done wonders for us, and we could never repay him for that. Instead, we simply join Paul in offering a tribute to God's wondrous ways that prevent us from questioning and doubting God. Paul wrote, from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. What a tribute that Paul pays to God. Our God who is so great that heaven cannot contain him and yet he deigns to dwell in this little heart of mine. This sinful little heart of mine, God comes to dwell in his kingdom as Christ rules our hearts through faith. I can't always figure out what God's thinking. Just like the Bible class can't always figure out what their pastor is thinking. I can't always look at the dots of events in my life and connect them and go, oh, that's what God wants. That's God's will in my life. Sometimes the dots don't seem to fit. Sometimes they remain very shadowy. And that's when we remember that tribute that Paul gives, and this evening we repeat, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom 
and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Amen.